Well, hello and welcome back. The next story that we're going to look at right now says, I was a pastor at a mega church. Then someone asked me a question that turned my life upside down. Well, let's look and see what the question was. Today, we are looking at why the Christians are upset with the Olympics, so much so that the Olympic sponsors decided to pull their sponsorship. They removed their advertisement. I guess they thought everything was going to be okay. And I'm saying, hey, you know what? I don't know that they should be upset at all. I don't think any of the Christian people should be upset. And I do hope that this makes somebody scratch their head as to why I would even say that. Because what I believe will happen is it will provoke thought and it will make you sort of put the lines together to say, you know what, maybe she's got a point because yeah, the church has become a place that I'm a little bit, you know, sad to say I'm even a party to. So let's get into this article. It says, I was a pastor at a mega church. Then someone asked me a question that turned my life upside down. The words coursed through my body, looking for an answer. And I, an answer I owed myself. Huh. Let's make this a little larger so you can see it. He said it was a question that he owed himself an answer. He stood just inside of my office. He pulled the door closed behind him. Quote, I need to ask you a question, he told me. It was 2015. I was a 44-year-old pastor. My desk was cluttered with set lists of upcoming church series. That weekend, I was to sing Beautiful Things by Michael Gungor, a song that I adored, I promised I could be new. It promised I could be new. There was nothing that I wanted more. Are you gay, Matt? Was the question. There it was. It surprised me, but I was strangely calm. It was a question I had been asked since college, a question I'd been haunted by since junior high. The words coursed through my body looking for an answer, an answer I owed only myself, he says. I was sure his question also lingered in the mind of other colleagues and the community. I'd built around myself, even if I had been married to a woman for 20 years. Quote, sure, he's gay, but he's doing God a solid by living like a straight man, avoiding the wide path that leads to eternal darkness. The article continues. Most knew it wasn't their business to ask, but he wanted to know. He had his reasons. A list of books I purchased from Amazon were visible on my profile. One of the church parishioners had seen it, and this information had gotten around. The particular book in question was about sexual orientation. It was searching for answers, even though answers weren't or weren't what I needed. Even though answers weren't what I needed. Freedom, he says, was what I needed. Quote, are you? He asked again. He didn't seem angry. He seemed uncomfortable and rightly so, but I wasn't. I was born into the church like it was my effing birthright, he says. I was used to judgment in churches like mine were renowned for it. I'd never seen him look unsure of himself. This was a good leader, decisive and strong. He'd always treated me well. I wondered if he paused outside my office before entering. I wondered how long it had taken him to find the courage to ask the question. We both could, could end my career as a pastor. It felt like someone had put him up to it, even if he believed that someone was God. Quote, I have never cheated on her, not ever, I finally said. I didn't answer his question, but I did tell the truth. There was cheap tension between us something neither of us was being compensated for. 
if I could go back in time, I'd look him directly in the eye and I'd say, yeah, I'm gay. So effing what? Less than six months later, he says, I would be gone from that church, not because I was gay, but because I'd been publicly calling attention to our co collective lack of love, care, and support for the LGBTQ community, he says. As a spiritual community, we needed to do better. Years earlier, while working at a different church as a young minister, I joined AVOL, AIDS Volunteers of Lexington, serving as a caregiver for queer individuals with HIV and AIDS. Initially, I questioned my board members who wanted to know if I had ulterior motives of saving someone's soul. I told them I didn't. After that, they passed me through and I met Philip. I did Philip's laundry, took him to the doctor appointments and attended his very gay birthday party with my six month old baby girl. You letting that sit in? Cause I'm letting it sit in. Just let that sit there. Just park it there for just a second. She was, he, the pastor's, pastor had a daughter and she was six months old. He took the baby. He took the baby with him. I tried to get our church involved in the upcoming annual AIDS walk, a tangible way to put our message of love, hope, and service to work. I posted a sign-up sheet in our church lobby. Unfortunately, though, not surprising, no one from our church showed up for the event. 16 years later, I'd grown weary of the church's reticence and downright opposition, including the LGBTQ people in spiritual communities. So I began having conversations mostly behind closed doors and over time was seen as a sympathizer. April of 2015, I wrote and published an essay about Caitlyn Jenner encouraging Christian people to embrace our transgender brothers and sisters by listening to their stories using their chosen pronouns and loving them in real ways. Within 48 hours, I received an email from leadership asking me to retract my public statements, which is when I knew it was time to go. He said, I got to go. Our church welcomed 8,000 people each weekend. It was a mega church. Each weekend, I stood before a massive crowd singing my guts out about the love of God. But I knew if I stayed, I'd never be able to sing over my queer family or safely invite them into that space. I couldn't do it anymore, he says. I wasn't thrown out, he writes. Instead, I was told they wouldn't tolerate my public saying things about welcoming queer people. But it was too late. Something had changed in me. I couldn't make that promise. So I resigned. I imagine leadership was relieved. He walked away, but he wasn't fired. This was the story. This was how we shared it with the congregation. It never got ugly during that time of transition. I would never have done that and neither would they. Instead, we walked quietly away from each other. My question is, <clears throat> why are Christians mad at the Olympics? I'll hold. Nothing. It's okay. I got more. So the next story that we're going to look at brings us here. Brings us here to Myrtle Beach. Let's take a gander. Myrtle Beach. Pride Month, we're featuring the faces of those who appear in this year's Portraits of Pride. Tonight, a pastor who is working to open the minds of the faithful by being himself. WBC's Brandon Truitt with the story at the intersection of religion and identity. On any given day, you'll find Pastor Brandon Thomas Crowley in his office under a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But his real work is done here. You've got to learn how to see your differences as what God wants to use. Behind the pulpit of Myrtle Baptist Church in Newton, the 37-year-old has come a long way from his childhood in Rome, Georgia. But he knew from the beginning he wanted to preach. 
I've always been very enamored by the black church. I was raised in the black church. Uh, the deacons and leaders of my home churches were like superheroes to me. And I looked up to them. They were my Michael Jordans. But there's an added layer to this story. Crowley is gay, and he says he always has been. When I would preach on the front porch, I would often do so in my grandmother's high heels. Crowley navigated a career of ministry cloaked in one of the most contentious cultural debates of our time, homosexuality at the intersection of religion. He ran into resistance from the beginning. I remember one time there were kids outside that were throwing rocks at me and laughing at me because I was on the front porch preaching with uh, a robe on with my grandmother's high heels and a stiff rag that she used for washing dishes. And I ran in the house and I was crying with my Bible and she looked at me and she turned me about face and she said, you go back out there and you continue preaching. His family affirming from the start, identities, be it sexual or religious, can be hard to balance for many in the LGBTQ community. It seems impossible for some. Crowley says it's not always been smooth sailing, but he's been confident he was not the problem. I have always known that I was queerfully and wonderfully made. The queering that I do in churches is not bringing churches into the world or bringing the world into churches. It's actually drawing churches closer to the original message of Christ, which is about love and acceptance. Crowley went to Morehouse Harvard Divinity School and finished with a doctorate from Boston University. He became pastor of the historic Myrtle Baptist Church in 2009. Years later, he would be guest preaching at another Boston in church where he would meet Tyrone Sutton. Years later, they would marry. I'm proud of the work that, that he's been able to do, and I encourage him so much because it means so much for musicians like myself. Sutton is successful in his own right. The assistant principal at the Boston Arts Academy plays organ. I'm asking this question. I have to pause in this because this is an actual four minute uh, audio uh, recording, I should say. My question is still remaining. Why are quote unquote Christians, according to the article, angry? Why are they angry at the Olympics? Let me share this with you. I'm going to let this play, and then I want to give you my commentary so that you understand exactly where I'm headed. At a different church. The soundscapes in our home are me upstairs mm -hmm. preparing for sermons and rehearsing my sermons <laughs> and out loud. And I'm down on the piano just getting, you know, playing the tracks that I'm getting ready for Sunday morning. Sutton was raised in Alabama just an hour from where Crowley grew up in Georgia, and he knows the struggle of coming up gay in church. And we have many times had to sit through off so often and listen to homophobic sermons, uh, homophobic messages in the church while still sitting there and have to play behind the, yeah, contributing to the process. And, and when you love doing what you do and you feel like you can't do it unless you hide, that it does something to you over mm, time. Mm. It really messes with you over time. Their goal in sharing their story to inspire others to be more themselves. Crowley, with a lesson from his grandmother, he still carries with him today. She would say to me all the time, baby, don't ever allow people to make you think there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with them. What a little love, grace, and acceptance can do. In Newton, Brandon Truitt, WBZ News. Wow. There is. All righty. I don't want to hear anything else she has to say, but I do want to take it to another one. Um, we're going to take, uh, we're, we're going to look at another story. We have to, we have to hold on just a moment. We got to take, we got to, because this is so, um, you know, it's actually elementary. You know what I'm sharing right now is just, it's actually just black and white. It's a black and white. Complicit is what the church has been for those who believe in the word and those who really do truly and honestly follow the word, when you heard a little rumble in your local church, you didn't put them out. When you heard a little rumble in your local church, you didn't question it. When you heard a little rumble in your local church, you didn't make any comments about it at all. You thought that you'd be judging if you did what the word says, did what the Bible says. Now you got a lot to deal with. We'll be right back.
Like a perspective